So we are looking for among those six rows, which rows have same values on those two SID columns. And you keep those and eliminate all the others. And the final result will be something like this. Why is that? If you look at this particular instance, this record will match, will pair with uh, both reserved records, which give you uh, two rows in the cross product. Among those two records, the first pair satisfy the natural norm condition, which means that they have same values on the common uh, attribute, which is SID. And you keep that, and you do the final projection by projecting out all the columns except only one copy for those two uh, common columns, which is SID. So for SID, you put that out only one copy, rather than two <coughs> columns of the same value, which is 22 in this case. <coughs> now move on to the second record from the uh, sailor's instance. This is actually an easier case to deal with because there is no matching record from the other side to satisfy the natural general requirements because the common attributes do not have same values. So both rows in the cross product will be eliminated. Then move on to the last record on sales. Again, it gives you two rows in the natural general, in, sorry, in the cross product, and only one of them satisfies your natural general requirement, and you keep that and you put out all the attributes except that, uh, except those uh, two common uh, values. You keep only one common. Okay, that's the natural. And there, <coughs> there are other types of joints that you can express. Uh, in addition to natural joint, we also have something called cedar joint. <coughs> cedar joint is really pretty much like natural joint, except that in addition to the bow tie sign, you have a condition supplied to the uh, subscript of the bow tie sign. Uh, that specifies your joint condition. So, Instead of having an implicit drawn condition on common attributes and having equal uh, equality uh, condition on those common attributes, here you explicitly set the drawn condition through this condition C. Okay, using this condition C. To give you an example, using the same instance we talked about just now, uh, this data drawn basically says I'm looking for all the rows in the cross product where this condition is met. Where this condition is met. So to <coughs> be more precise, we can define this as this. Okay? So that's how to express theta join in uh, using basic operators. Is that clear? Now that being said, how do we define natural join? How do we express that using uh, basic operator? Well, <coughs> this is still here. And obviously, you need a selection condition, which is I use common attribute 1, <coughs> common attribute, OK, let me see what that is. OK, common attribute CR1, CS1, that denotes the common attribute the first common attribute from R and S respectively. And let's continue. Until suppose you have M common attributes. <coughs> you have here the location. Okay, and how do you express that here? Well Okay. 
Yes, any question on this? Okay, very good. <coughs> and one special case you want to pay attention to is when this condition C uh, is a uh, equality condition. In other words, I may change this to exactly this. So I'm going to take this up here, <coughs> up here. So in other words, I put it here. My question is, now if I do that, is this the same as this? Is that the same as that? No, 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 right? Because you do not have a projecting the end. If you enforce equality condition on all common attributes using a theta join, you get something very close to natural join, except that those common attributes will appear twice uh, in the final result. That's the only difference. But if you do supply the projecting the end, now that gives you the uh, natural join. So you may, all, you may wonder why we need <coughs> natural join when we are already have theta drawn. Obviously, natural drawn is a special case of theta drawn subject to the projection in the end. Why you need that? Well, for uh, uh, notation convenience, right? Some, sometimes you just want to quickly join two tables by uh, their common attributes without the, the worry of uh, writing, explicitly writing out all the common attributes. Uh, then natural drawn gives you a quick way of doing that. Okay, so far, those are <coughs> some of the advanced operators that can be expressed using the combination of basic operators, uh, and uh, those are used, some of the useful operators in relation to algebra. Now, let's move on to the last one uh, in the advanced category that can be expressed as a combination of basic operators, but this one is a little bit tricky. Right? This one is debated. <laughs> R divided by S, or using the slice notation A divided by B, the same. Right? This A and B are S, R and S just denote uh, some schema of your, of your input. Right? <coughs> so instead of looking at this, let me give you a concrete example to understand what a division does. Then we come back and try to understand <coughs> semantically what exactly it means. Right? So suppose I have a table like this, which tells you which student working or works on which product. So the first pair tell you student one works on product one, student one works on product two, so on and so forth. Okay, very simple. Now, I want to ask a very simple question, which is, tell me all the students who work in uh, Project 2. I want to find all students who work on Project 2. How do you do that? Well, this is something you can express by division. If you do A divided by B, in this case B1, because B, B1 is a specific instance of B. What do you get? You get all students working on Project 2. <coughs> Extending this example, to another instance of B. If I do A divided by B2, here B2 is um, product 2 and product 4. What do you get? You got students who work on both product 2 and product 4, uh, which is S1 and S4. Okay? Now I want to find students who work on all three products, P1, P2, and P4. What do you get? You get uh, only S1, because only a student S1 has worked on all those products. So, <coughs> excuse me. From this motivating example, we, uh, we can see uh, the semantic behind uh, the division operator, which is to find all the attributes from the first table that match with all values from the second table. Okay, we find attributes from the first table that has a matching pair in the first table, when you consider all the possible matches between that attribute and the values from the second table. Is that clear? The challenge is how do I formalize what I have just said? Right? How do I formalize what I have just said? Okay. <coughs> <coughs> this requires some uh, discrete math uh, background, right? Uh, but I assume all of you have uh, background uh, uh, in that subject, right? So the Kelly bracket you know a set, you know a set. And this vertical bar means condition on. Condition on. Okay? I'm looking for all the x such that you can read this as condition on or such that. I'm looking for all the x 
such that for any y, this this bridge for uh, for any this bridge as for any for any y belong to B, this bridge as exists there there is or there exists there is a pair x y belong to A. Okay. <coughs> for any y. There must be a x and y pair in A. If that's the case, these are the x I'm looking for. These are the x I'm looking for. Yeah. So is this ideally used when there's a many to one relationship? I mean, well, what you are looking for is <coughs> it's not it's not really a many to one thing, right? Because let me see what you are saying. Uh, many to one doesn't mean. Uh, uh, every one in the B side has at least one matching tuple on the other side. So these two are not equal. Okay. Now, after understanding this, the next challenge is how do you express this using uh, basic operators? How do you express this using basic operators? Uh, I'm going to do that over the, the chalkboard over here. <coughs> so the idea is, okay, <coughs> you want to find all those x that has at least one matching pair for any y from b, right? So in, to, in order to find those x, why not I find those x who do not satisfy this condition? Which means there is at least one y that this x does not match to that in the original A. If I can find all those x, then I use all possible x from A minus away those x, I get what I want. You follow my argument? So I break this into two parts, which is I want to find all those x who has at least one y from B that it doesn't match to. Okay? Then I use all the x minus away those. The challenge is how do you find such x that has at least one y from b that it doesn't match to, right? Uh, the, the idea of doing that is you find all possible matchings between x and y, regardless whether this x and y appear in the original a or not. You find all possible pairs, kind of like a bipartite graph between a complete bipartite graph between x and y. Then you minus away a, the original ones. And then you get all those x that do not match with at least one y. <coughs> it's kind of like imagine I want to find all. Let's say we have a a, a pair of uh, each team has two members. I want to find among you guys uh, what are the teams we have. So what I do, I find all possible pairwise matching among all of you. So if you have n of you, I have n square pairs. Then I minus away the actual teams between two of you. If you, two of you has in a, in a team, I, I, have, I have a link. Then I, I minus away all those links from my complete bipartite graphs. The remaining links tell me the x that has at least one y it doesn't match to. That's the idea. Okay. Let me write it down, then uh, I can All those x who does not match to at least one y. You, you agree? This is all the possible pairs, whether they have a pair or not in A. But this is all the possible pairings between x and y. And this is those. Imagine that's my input, right? This is the x and y. What this does is This complete bipartite graph between the two. I don't have another color, I wish I do. Oh. I don't. Okay. Uh, so you're going to use both. So what's in A, so 
call this as my A. Of course, that cannot be the case because if you have a point like this, it must be uh, this. There is at least one link in A, including this guy. Right? So, so now this on my, on my A, and minus away A, what do I get? I get. And then I put out all those x, which is this guys. Then I put out all the x minus with those x. What do I get? I get this guy I want, which is the one x that match with all possible ones. So I do need to do. Okay. We're done. Okay. Questions? You have a question for me. Alright, that concludes our discussion on relation algebra and you will find exercises on these topics from the homework. Uh, let me just run through some uh, simple examples in class. Then we move on to the next, uh, uh, <coughs> next topic. Find name of theta to be zero both from three. We use these input uh, examples. How do I do that? Well, solution number one, very simple. You uh, From the reserve table, you find all the reservations made on both from three. Then you next draw drawn with theta's. You put out the name. You follow me? That's, those are your schemas and instances. Right? What you do is you put it out. By the way, one thing I, I would like to remind you is when you construct a query, right, you do not want to query by example. For example, find name of zero could be zero both one three. One potential solution. If you know the instances you have, is by just rarely inspecting this. And you check this, you say, oh, which one? 58 with 0, 1, 3, the name is Rusty. So I do a selection from theaters where I said e equal to 58, and put that out uh, the name. That is wrong, right? Because you, the instance can change any time. You don't want to rewrite your query every time the instance uh, has updated. Uh, using another example, you can do viewer inspection, inspection like this and find out your answer and only pinpoint to select those answers. But what about if I, if I give you a table with one billion rows? Right? You may argue, when do you have one billion rows? That's impossible. Well, I can tell you totally possible, right? Maybe not billion, right? I'll give you a million. Good luck with that, right? So you cannot do a, a query by example, right? So that's one solution. Another solution is you do. <laughs> <coughs> you do the natural join between the two, then you find out only those on uh, 103, then you put out the name. Of course, among the two, which, which is more efficient? Yes. It goes without saying, obviously, the first one is more efficient, <coughs> but this goes back to an important subject I said in <coughs> lecture one, which is a fundamental feature of database management system is to focus on what you want and not how you do it, how to get what you want. The how part uh, is <coughs> is a main uh, <coughs> excuse me is a main component that inside a database kernel that they will figure out the how somehow automatically for the user. So this is dramatically different from uh, using a programming language like C or C++ or Java or Python or anything like that. In those languages. You need to specify not only what you want, but also how to do it. Give you an example, if you do sorting, very simple uh, sorting uh, uh, operation. Uh, when you first approach computer science, you may do a bubble sort. For each element, check against the remaining ones, move on to the second one, check, 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 check. And swap when you find a, a, a misplacement. Right? But the algorithm takes n square uh, cost to do. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is, if you implement this algorithm in any uh, language, you need to specify what and how. What is sorting, that's what you do, and how. <coughs> Another example is merge quick sort. You find a pivot, you split, and recurse. What is the same, but how it's different. But in, in, uh, in relational algebra and SQL, 
you only worry about what? You don't worry about how. The how is taken care of by the underlying data, the kernel, which is the central object of this class. Later on, we will dive into that and show you how to do the how. Yeah, question? So is the cross product often the bottleneck in the uh, or totally, totally. Cross product is essentially uh, the reason why Oracle and all this company can make so much money. Because if it is a single table operation, in the worst case, you resolve to sorry, you can pretty much solve all problem on single problem. Which means that in the worst case, any query on single table involve probably n log n uh, query cost. And oftentimes, you can do much better than that linear. But when once you go to multiple tables, like two tables, uh, if you are not careful in what you do, uh, then the naive implementation oftentimes is n square. Like you pointed out, cross border is n square. N square is not going to work in practice. Okay. <coughs> uh, let's give another example. Uh, here you basically do a next draw among all three input uh, schemas. Uh, a more efficient uh, implementation would be to uh, find all the red ball first before you do the next draw and only carry the red balls into your remaining joint operations. Uh, an even more uh, sufficient uh, implementation is not only you find all the red balls, but you only you also put out only those columns that are necessary for the join, and then you carry out the join <coughs> in that manner. Here, once you join with reserve, you put out away all the unnecessary columns and keep only the, the necessary column, which is SID in this case. Uh, find a set of reserve, a uh, red or green vote. Uh, this is just a union. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, you can do this by union, of course. But a more efficient solution is to, in the very first step, find those votes that are either red or green. Then you go from there. The, the remaining uh, parts of the join stay the same. Uh, if I change the condition a little bit from all to and, <coughs> it may be tempted to simply flip the sign from all to end, but that's wrong because there are no both that's green and red at the same time. So if you do that, you end up with an empty result, which is wrong. So the right way of doing this is to do an intersection. You find all those serial who reserve a red boat, you find those serial who reserve a green boat, you do an intersection of the two, that gives you the serial who reserve both uh, colors. Okay. And, and in this particular example, we introduce another uh, convenient uh, notation that will be very useful uh, for you to express in relation algebra, uh, which is the concept of uh, the renaming operator. Uh, it's written as the Greek letter Rho. What it does is take a pair <coughs> as input. The second <laughs> element in the pair <coughs> is a relational algebra expression. And the first element in the pair is how do you want to represent the output of that relational algebra <coughs> expression. In other words, I want to represent this whole thing as temp red. So this now substitutes this. Whenever you see this, you can substitute this into that. Okay? So that gives you a really convenient way to express the intersection of the two. Otherwise, you have to do an intersection with this long expression uh, with another long expression. You follow me? And in addition to that, you can rename <coughs> individual attributes in the output as well. So if you do this, what do you get in the end? The temp red is the theta IDs who reserve red bolt. This is the theta ID who reserve a green bolt. But you may argue there, there might be a confusion here. Uh, both attributes are theta ID. I don't like that. I want to be really uh, clear what I mean by those set IDs. So what you can do is you can rename them into, for example, temp red with a subscript SID to red SID. You call me? <laughs> this will rename the output to this and the attribute in the output that match this to this name. Okay. Another way, by the way, another way to refer to an attribute in the output 
One is by name, of course, as I've shown here. The other is by its positional information. I can also do or I can do this basically means rename the first attribute in the output to this. And the first attribute is essentially this. So these are these two are equivalent in this example. Okay? Question. So when you rename the attributes, then how do you do the natural drawing? How do you do the natural drawing? Good question. Uh, if you rename of the attributes, <coughs> the natural drawing happens by looking for common attributes that explicitly share the same name, right? So if you rename the attributes, you can no longer do a natural drawing here. Of course, you can argue a lot of system knowledge are pretty smart. And they can figure out the common attribute by their type. And as well as there's something called lineage. Which is the trace where this relation or attribute come from. So they can do inference automatically on their own to figure out these are actually the same type of attributes. Good. Okay. <coughs> Uh, let's look at another example. Find the name instead of reserve all votes. This is a division example, right? You find all the votes, you use reserve uh, divided by all the votes, that gives you all the uh, sailors who reserve uh, all votes. Uh, but there are some uh, subtle issues we need to pay attention to in this example. Uh, let me go over that. If you just do reserve, you have a vote. Uh, this is wrong. Okay. This does not work. Why? Can someone tell me why this is wrong? <coughs> Can someone, someone tell me why this is wrong? So I, I haven't remembered all your names yet, but I can use the positional index to, uh, to refer to that, just as I show you. It's a two-dimensional space, so it's very simple. It's not like we're in an n-dimensional space. Yeah. When at the very least you need to project the vote ID <coughs> out of votes? <coughs> you need to do this first because otherwise, what otherwise in votes? All the fields in vote. It's all the attributes including the name and the color, but we do not have name and color in reserve. So if you do without if you do this without the vote ID, none of the sailors actually match with any of your Y. No. None of the X from here match with your Y because none of them has name, color, and all that. So you do need to print out all the vote ID. But is this now fine? Let me find someone else. <coughs> so what about the person sitting next to you? Yes. It is. So tell me what are the X here? What are the X? In terms of schema, in terms of schema, what are the acts here? So reserve, let me show you the, the schema for the reserve. Reserve has set ID, fold ID, and date. Right? And both, after you do the projection, the only schema, uh, the, uh, the only attribute in the schema is simply fold ID. So this is your Y, what is your X? <laughs> So we need another join with the sailors to get the SID first and then map it to the sailors. You need to do another join. The name, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the name as name. yet. Okay. I'm asking what is the X here? The SID. So we need to project SID and behind the SID. Actually it's SID. Yeah. We get all sorts of answers. No, it's BID should be Say again? BID uh, should be equal. BID should be equal. Yeah, that would right. be the, so we need to project, we need to specify it. Uh, no, I'm asking what is X. First thing, right? In my, okay, let me write it out. I'm looking for all the X. Right? Remember, that's what I have just now. I'm asking not the value of X, I'm asking the schema of X. Schema of X. That's 
Just as I need. Okay, well, I got one answer one as I need. Say it again. Say it again. Okay, bingo. Okay, finally we have a bingo. Uh, if you look at the definition, right? X and Y belong to A and Y is B. I, uh, y is B. I, uh, sorry, no, no, it's not. It's B, I. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, it's not bingo. Okay. Any any uh, further answer? Huh? All two. Okay. Who said I said you What is your y? Your y is B I D, right? So this is your y, and this becomes your x. Your x y must be in A, right? So your x is x I D and, and date. In terms of schema. So if you do this, what do they mean? You find all the x that match with all the y, which means what you are really looking for is all the sailor IDs who reserve all boats on the same date. Which is not what I'm asking here. You can reserve all boats across different dates. So to fix that, how do we fix that? I want to make my x be only SID, which means A must be only SID and boat ID. I need to do this. Do you follow me? And after you got this, what do you got? You, what's your X? Your X is not a simply S ID. This gives you all the sailor IDs who reserve all the boats. What about the name? Well, now you take this and then draw the sailors and you put that out the name. Okay? What about a sailor who reserve all interlake boats? Well, that's before you do the production on boat ID, this gives you all the boat ID, rather I just want to find interlake boat ID, so I have another selection condition. I'm done. What's wrong? Can you the fact that why for the boat rank S I D and date, why did why not the same date for all the S I Ds? So again, why I have S I D and date here? So, uh, that's because uh, if you look at this definition of division, <coughs> x and y belong to A and y is both ID. So x must be whatever except both ID, which means that, that must be S ID and date. So after we get S ID and date, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Because then what you're looking for is not all the sailors who reserve all boats, but all the sailors who reserve all the boats on the same date. Right? Because that means for each x, match with all the other way, but each X now has two elements, which is S, I, D, and date. You are enforcing the same value on date as well, which is not what the question calls. Yeah. Uh, what I hope it is. Okay. And I promise you the links are there. Let's just show you quickly. I have the live streaming link. Let's test whether it works. Oh, it's not. Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. Right? And I should show up in a bit. <laughs> All right, my two seconds of fame. Here you go. All right, so then there is a YouTube channel link. Uh, that's your lecture one. Okay. And your homework. Uh, move on to SQL. All right, so SQL. So we're going to spend, I think, uh, this lecture and uh, Tuesday lecture to cover SQL, then we're done. Then we go to the kernel. Okay. Uh, SQL, 
Many of you, <coughs> I think, may have used SQL before, but uh, the lecture I'm going to give you might surprise you with what SQL can do, and let me challenge uh, um, what you know about SQL. Okay. So <laughs> the basic concept of SQL is very simple. As DDL, DML, those things we covered. Uh, by the way, for the, this part of lecture, we will set up a database server, and we will give you an account to access our database server with real database instances, and you are able to pr pr practice your uh, SQL statement against that database, and in fact, there will be a homework uh, after uh, the first homework that asks you to do a bunch of uh, SQL queries against that database. Uh, we will give you the details of that on Tuesday's lecture. Uh, uh, this is a review I'm going to skip. Uh, to look at DDL in a uh, closer, uh, to take a closer look at DDL. So here is what you do. <coughs> so this basically is using a regular expression syntax. If you don't know what regular expression, let me explain that very briefly. Uh, capital letter uh, are the keywords we learn from the regular expression syntax. And the bold means that they are required. You must have this in constructing an instance of this expression. Uh, small case letter and emphasize italic. Those means that uh, those are parameters that you will supply value for. Uh, uh, this grid letter uh, basically means they are optional, uh, under, especially if they are under a square bracket. That means optional. Okay. So what this says is. You must have query table, and you must supply a table name of your choice. You must have at least at least one column with its name and type to construct an instance of query table statement. But well, first, you may have more uh, column name and data type, and in addition, you may have uh, default expression column constraint and table constraint. So that's essentially what this expression means. Is that clear? Okay. Now, <coughs> the data type. <coughs> excuse me. The data type uh, includes the following. Uh, this is not uh, a complete list of possible data types you have in a database. Okay. And the data types supported by a database server will be different uh, depending on what database windows. Uh, you, are using, you are using, right? So it will be uh, a different from Oracle to uh, SQL Server to DB2 and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> bunch of data types. Among them, the most interesting one is character N and character variant N. Uh, so that deserves uh, some discussion. Let me throw uh, that out. Uh, we will come back to this later on once we go into the kernel uh, of a database. <coughs> Disk, the actual number of bytes. 
for that value. So if you take this and place, place this value into this column, it will occupy only 10 bytes on disk, exactly 10 bytes on disk. You may wonder what happens if you put a value that's longer than 20 bytes. But in either case, depending on the system, some system will reject it, some system will truncate the value to only 20 bytes. In the second option, then you see no difference between the two. They all occupy 20 bytes. <coughs> you may wonder why this matters. Sounds like this is always a good solution. Why? Because take name as an example, if you look at the distribution of the length of names. I draw this out, this is the length, this is the frequency, how often a name of that length appears? What do you expect? What this curve looks like? Well, something like this. And this may be, I don't know, somewhere between 8 and 10. Right? Mm, maybe a little, so maybe 12 to 16. Yeah. Right? The typical length of a people name is about in that range. You see the peak over there. Really long name, really, really rare. Really short name, really rare. But I can give you some example of really long name. Right? It's like, I'm one of my friends. I will always use uh, his name as an example. Right? Right? Marius Hachilafahiru. I'm a people great. He's one of my great friends, and uh, he used to be a database researcher. Uh, I, I think he interned at Google then uh, at AT&T Lab. Uh, then somehow money lured him away. He now is in a trading company doing high frequency trading. Uh, but he's a really good uh, database researcher and a really good coder. And his name is really long, and so he's like here. So if you were to use this, to cater for this, what do you ha what you have to do? This value must be really big to cater for the, the worst case in in your uh, in your possible instances. Right? What that, what that means is this has cannot be twenty. This power has to be hundred or something. So if my name goes to a column like this, you are wasting a lot of space. Rather, if you take this approach, everything is really nice because it occupies exactly how long it takes. So why don't we always go with the second option? <coughs> well, there are some system implications uh, that actually make this much harder to deal with than this. We will come back to this later on. Okay. Uh, now we look at column constraint and table constraint. Column constraint are constraint that you want to express and associate that with a particular column. The, the example I gave you from last lecture, for example, the university student age must be 18 years old. Uh, that can be a column constraint, because age is a single column. So after you express age and integer, you simply follow that by a Boolean expression, age greater or equal than 18. Check. Right? There's a, uh, there's a <coughs> keyword called constraint. <coughs> So you just check, followed by a Boolean expression. So check H greater equal to 18, that expressed uh, that particular constraint I mentioned. And we also have this referential integrity constraint we talk about uh, in foreign key. So it says references, if this single column is a foreign key on another table, it is a key on another table, it becomes a foreign key in the current table. So you need to specify which table it references to. Right? So you see references, the reference table, the reference column, and you want to specify on delete and on update what action you want to take. Remember there are a few uh, different actions you may possibly do when the record on the other side it refers to get deleted or updated. Right? You can either do no action, <coughs> which means I do allow a dumping pointer like uh, key reference to exist, or I cascade the delete, meaning that if the record it refers to get deleted, I will also delete the current record from the current table. I'll set to not, I'll set to some default value. Same thing can be set for on update. Okay, that's it. Uh, what about table constraints? Very similar, uh, <coughs> except that now uh, you can specify uh, uh, 
uh, in addition to those expressions involve a single column, now you can specify those constraints and expressions involve multiple columns because table constraints appear in the very end of pre table statement. So here you can do unique for candidate keys and primary key. <coughs> And here, this column name can be a list of columns instead of a single column. If you do it as a column constraint, it automatically limits it to only a single column because it appears right after that column. But as a table constraint, you do not have that constraint anymore. So let me give you some examples. <coughs> so, so this is a column constraint. <coughs> and this is a table constraint. <coughs> In fact, this one, because it involves only a single column, it can also be expressed by a column constraint. But in this particular case, we choose to do that using a, a table constraint. Here is another example. In this example, this condition cannot be expressed as a column constraint because it involves more than one column. So it has to be a table constraint that appears in the end of predictable standard. Okay? Now, DNL, we saw this example before, so I'm going to skip this. On this. Uh, we saw this example as well, right? The drawn simple draw before uh, between two tables. The conceptual evaluation of this is what? Cross product, check the where clause in the cross product, keep those rows, satisfy the where clause, and do the projection in the very end. Now you understand the select here is really a projection. You follow me? So if you were to transfer this to relational algebra, what you would do is Take select as selection as uh, as in relation algebra. Select in SQL really means projection. Okay. Uh, so these are very simple uh, examples uh, uh, to take a closer look at SQL. Uh, this is the structure of a typical SQL statement. You have the select clause, from clause, and where clause, and this is pretty much what I have told you earlier. The only thing is I add another keyword on top which is distinct. You may wonder why you have a distinct keyword there. This has to do with uh, efficiency <coughs> issues. <coughs> and we said, projection in uh, relation algebra needs to worry about one thing, which is duplicate dimension. So by default, this is duplicate free. In other words, the output are distinct by default. In, in SQL, however, that's not the case. The reason is, the exercise I gave you towards the end of the last lecture, I said how to do duplicate elimination. So this is probably the right time to ask to throw that question out. Yeah. Okay. Solution one is hashing on the of course on the. Yeah. Uh, hash on, on those columns that you want to detect duplicate. Right? You must do the hashing on those columns you want to detect duplicate on, and this will, the uh, incoming record will be hashed into different markets. If you do whatever hashing with mod. Here. And then you just, from each bucket, uh, you do a linear scan, remove duplicates. Or you can maintain a small kind of hash map here, a binary tree essentially. And insert it if the value does not exist, ignore it if the value is already there. 
Uh, this works well in practice. However, uh, if you look at its theoretical guarantee, uh, it can be really bad because if you hashing function, if your hash function is not properly designed, uh, you may not have a nice load balance into different buckets. What you end up with is possible that this is a really nice scenario. Huh? What's a really bad scenario? This. It's possible, right? For example, I want to remove duplicates from you guys and I hash by whether you are a University of Utah student. That's a really bad hash function for this group of students. But if I'm talking about college students from the nation hash by their university uh, affiliation, then that the same hash function becomes a really good hash function. In other words, from this simple example, it tells you it's not easy to design a good hash function because what is good really depends on your input data distribution and which you have no control over. Right? You follow me? So what, uh, what is the alternative solution? Sort. Sort. Okay, sort. Go, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to see if the two next to each other are. Because then it's just a linear scan. Let me see your example, let me show you an example. What do you get? You got then you can do a linear scan and maintain one running counter and cross. So the total cost is and in big old notation this is gone, so it's and this has the worst case performance guarantee and guaranteed work. Okay? Uh, <laughs> but one thing <coughs> is that when I write like this, I assume the data can fit in the memory. What about if your data is large? Since we're dealing with database, your data size oftentimes is greater than the size of your memory. Uh, then the bound is no longer this. And what is that bound? We'll talk about that later on. But in but the essence of Sorting can be really expensive. Uh, that's why in SQL, by default, a projection, a select clause, does not remove duplicates by default. That is done for uh, efficiency consideration in practice. So how do we enforce duplicate elimination in SQL? Well, that's the purpose of the distinct keyword. That basically tells the system, I do want to remove duplicates. Do that for me, regardless of uh, the efficiency issue. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, first, I think this is pretty much what I said earlier. You do the cross product, check and the rows in the product, find those ones that satisfy your condition, do the production, and check duplicate if this thing is supplied. Okay, now the details. These are simple uh, running examples. Let me uh, move on to the more uh, sophisticated example. That's Start with three, uh, the same instances we use for relational algebra. Uh, these are the schema of those relational algebra. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, relational uh, uh, relational so instances. Quick question, question about this. It seems like you mentioned before something about like a filter with, with this kind of problems. Like, I just remember something about the I don't, I don't know much about it. So, no <coughs> filter. Is a membership testing structure. It's a very succinct uh, membership testing structure. The idea of blue filter is actually very, very simple. The idea is the following you can tell a beach map. So, what's a beach map? It's an array of beats. Which means each of this is a single beat. Initially, there are zero. But the space cost, if you do that, the space cost 
is in space. Okay. And of course, there are three processing costs of if you do a value tree, there's the sorting cost, you do the hashing, then you, there's the hashing cost, pre processing cost. Then there's the query cost, but the query cost is not too bad. If the value tree, the query cost is large, hashing the query cost. If you, again, if you have a good balanced hash function, the query cost is it's constant. Right? Well, what happens if I want to use really small space, tiny space? For example, is this star a member of the galaxy? And if you maintain a hash table of sorting over the entire stars and planets in galaxy, space is huge. Huh? Space is huge. Uh, what do you do? Well, you can move your drug using bits and by hash an element into a particular position. And this basic cache acts to a position, and if it goes to this position, it's set to 1. So the problem is, if you use a really small number of bits, you may have clear. Another why they come and hash to the same bit, which means Bloom filter may have <coughs> what? false positive, but never has false negative, right? Because when a, another X comes, if I want to check this, if this is 1, that means Either some y is there or x is actually here. You're never going to miss an x. But you may potentially uh, do false positive. So, how do you reduce false positive rate? Well, you use multiple hash functions. Instead of just one, for each x, you do a multiple hash functions. You hash to multiple positions. And the y may collide with x here, but the chance that it collide with x on every single hash function is really small. The probability of that is really small. If you use independent uh, multiple hash functions. By doing this trick, you can dramatically reduce the number of bits required to represent this set and bring down your force positive bit dramatically. <coughs> you follow my idea? And a detailed analysis of this we will give that uh, uh, to you later on in this course when we move on to the topic of big data. <coughs> big data management. This is one of the... So, why is this <coughs> why is this related to duplicate elimination? Well, if you can maintain a blue filter somehow over your of your data in a streaming setting, the second time the same value show up, using a blue filter you can detect them. But again the challenge is there is false positive. So you cannot safely remove this and claim this as a duplicate because it may be just a clear with another x. The value are actually different. If there, are, if there is no false positive, yes, then this can be used for duplicate elimination. You maintain this structure on the slide in a streaming setting. Can you explain the false positive thing again? <laughs> same, different value of hash to the same bucket. That, that gives you false positive. Different value hash to the same bucket. Yes. For one hash function, for multiple hash functions, different value hash to all same particles. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at another query. This is simple. <coughs> Skip this. <coughs> Some notes on range variables. So, in the example we see, see so far, uh, we, uh, we see this variable S and E. And that's what we call a range variable in SQL. A range variable in SQL, the first useful thing of range variable is to uh, save your writings, make your writing more convenient and easier to deal with. It's pretty much like the renaming operator in, uh, in relation algebra. <coughs> and you can do that over a relation in the front class. You can also do range variable for uh, the projection list. For example, I can do things like I can do things like this, but
to make it more meaningful. Translate to relational algebra, what I'm doing is
Well, the answer is no. As you got if the same sailor has a little multiple votes, you will find multiple matching pairs in the join of the dots, in the cross product. And if you don't remove the duplicates, the sailor ID will show up multiple times, the same sailor ID. But I think the thing is that no matter how many reservations you make, I show you sailor ID value only once. Okay. And what's the effect of replacing sailor ID by sailor name? <laughs> The slide class. Well, the effect is you may remove some potential, uh, potentially uh, qualifying uh, sailors because if his or her name happen to be the same as another sailor, then depending on who show up first, uh, the second sailor will uh, be penalized because you, you even even though both sailors have made at least one reservation, but only one of them will show up if they share the same name. But it doesn't uh, happen if you use CLID because CLID is the key. <coughs> but you said that the synaptic thing as your eyes projection, but with this projection, remove the duplicates in uh, If you have this thing, yes, it remove uh, duplicate. It, it, but if it doesn't have this thing, it doesn't remove duplicates by default, as I said just now, earlier. So by default, by default in SQL, <coughs> it doesn't remove the duplicates. In the relational algebra projection, in relational algebra, by default it does. And for efficiency property in SQL, it does not remove duplicates by default. That's why we introduce keyword distinct to give you the choice when you want to remove duplicates. <coughs> Expression is a simple, basically in the projection uh, class and in the where class. You can use a arithmetic uh, expression to express what you want. In the example I have shown you here, I skip this. <coughs> String operation. So, <coughs> in SQL, sometimes you want to do approximate matching uh, over strings, string values. You can, of course, do exact matching of strings. That's easy, just do cosine. Uh, but I want to do approximate matching. So what I mean is, is in this example, if I use y, uh, what I mean is, is I match with, this means uh, a wild card, so we match with any one character, but there must be a character here. This is a wild card match with zero or more characters, meaning that I can match with anything, and as well as empty. So what I said is this will match with a name Bob, it will also match with a name uh, Bob. There must be something here, and this is the option. Okay. Now, <coughs> consider I use, uh, <coughs> consider the little uh, red of in color code. You can do it either this way, this is pretty much what we did in relation algebra. You use the all condition on the color. Or you can do it by a union operator. Find all the sailor with the red and green and union that. I will finish this as stop right here. Okay. Uh, what about sailor reserve a red and a green color book? And as argued in the recent algebra case, if you change this to and it doesn't work. It gives you empty empty results, empty set results. So what you should do is to use intersection, right? Basically change this to intersection. But the challenge is in some relational database system they do not implement intersection. Why? Now we know why, because based on the argument for relation algebra, intersection is not a necessary operator. You can express that using the combination of basic operators. In particular, how do you do this in SPL without intersection? Well you use two instances, two copies of both and sitters, of both and reserves. In the first pair, you enforce red color. In the second pair, you enforce green color. In one join. You can make two copies of the same instance over both and, with, uh, and reserve. In the first pair, both ID must be the same, color is red. In the first, second pair, both ID must be the same, but color is green. And then you find those ID you put out. Alternatively, you can do intersect when it is available. But if it's not available, you can do this. With that, I stop right here. I will continue from 
ความเพียร next uh, next Tuesday